Everything's okay? All right. Yeah. Then I suggest that we uh, we start. We're a couple of minutes late, but that's okay. Um, we might have more people joining um, because we're luckily on the right Zoom link, uh, which is also the Zoom link that's online. So if people do message you and trying to figure out where to go, please tell them to go to the online schedule. That's where the uh, the correct Zoom link is. Um, but uh, but we'll go ahead for now. Um, so it's a, a, a dual chair and discussion for this session. So it's, uh, it's uh, Chiara and me, um, and I will be chairing the first half, and Chiara will be chairing the second half. Um, and in the first half, we'll have um, two presentations, which are 15 minutes each. Uh, and after that, we'll just have a couple of minutes, say five minutes uh, for some uh, questions. And then we'll have a, a general discussion, which Chiara will uh, will introduce and uh, and lead. Uh, we'll have a ten minute comfort break, um, and then we'll come back. And then we have uh, another three presentations, um, um, and again some general discussion after that. Um, any questions you have, uh, please let's not interrupt. Of course, during the uh, presentations, you can write them in the chat, and I'm happy to read them out. Um, also, um, you can just raise your hand. We're not that many people, so the, the chaos is uh, going to be limited. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll just see how that goes. Um, so the first speaker is uh, Mat uh, Martina uh, Romagnoli, I hope I pronounced that in the right way, um, from the Institute of Neurological Sciences in Bologna. Um, and she's going to talk about uh, chromatic pupillometry and the methods for isolating the, uh, the melanopsin retinal ganglion cell contribution to the pupillary light response. So I'll stop sharing if you want to share your uh, screen, Martina. Okay. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to share my screen. And, um, okay. Could you see? My screen? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, so good afternoon. I'm going to present uh, how our chromatic pupillometry method for isolating melanopsin retinal ganglion cells contribution to pupillary light response. Before starting, uh, some basic concepts about uh, melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. So these cells mediate the eye non image forming function predominantly including circadian rhythms and the pupillary light reflects. In particular, the photo entrainment of circadian rhythm to the, light to the light dark cycle is regulated by the connections between the eye and melanopsin retinal ganglion cells to the suprachiasmatic nucleus of uh, hypothalamus. And also, MRGCs are fundamental for the regulation of the pupillary light reflex through day, day projections to the olivary protectinal nucleus. So we know that these cells contain melanopsin photopigment, which is maximally sensitive to blue light around 480 nanometers. And in the case of the pupillary light reflex, this is translated into a sustained pupil response that is called PIPR, which stands for post illumination pupil response. We also know that melanopsin containing processes stratified both in the inner and outer lamina of the inner plexiform layers. And through these processes, melanopsin retinal ganglion cells establish contacts with road and cone bipolar cells. In this regard, Wang and colleague evaluated in mice road and cone inputs to MRDCs and showed a very sensitive on-channel input deriving from the primary road pathway, here highlighted in red. And so melanopsin retinal ganglion cells are intrinsically photosensitive, but they can fire through extrinsic road and cone inputs as well. So we can say that the MRDC contribution to the pupillary light reflex is a, re is a combination of road cone and melanopsin mediated signals. So here I just reported a simplification of the eye anatomy. So we know that light passes through the cornea, pupil, and lens to reach our retina light sensitive photoreceptors. The pupil is a dynamic structure that changes its diameter in response to luminance. So 
dilating in dim light and constricting in bright light. And this constriction, this constriction is what we know, is what we call the pupillary light reflex. So the varying size of the pupil as a physiological response to light. Okay, so we said that melanopsin retinal ganglion cell activity is a combination of road cone and melanopsin mediated signals. But how can we distinguish between these signals? One way to do so is using the chromatic pupillometry technique um, in which different wavelengths and intensity of, of light are used to separate the road MFDC and con contribution to the PLR. And in this slide, you can see pictures of pupils presented with different light stimulus and these pictures showing us the basic concept of the chromatic pupillometry technique. In particular, in the graph on the right and on the left, you, we can see pictures of pupils that are receiving a, a light stimulus that does not activate the melanopsin photopigment. So the pupils is so the pupil constricts and delays quickly, while in the graph in the middle. We have a pupil receiving a light stimulus that activated the melanopsin photopigment. Sorry. And so the pupil is showing a delay latency and a sustained response that persists well after the offset of the light stimulus. So, um, thanks to the. Okay, sorry. Okay. Thanks to the illuminating work of the Dr. Jason Park, we could set up our chromatic pupillometry protocol, which is divided into three steps. So the first steps, the first step where we use low luminance blue flash to isolate specifically the road contribution to the PLR. A second step in which we use an high luminance blue flash to isolate the MRGC contribution to the PLR and um, the use of a red flash to isolate the cone contribution to the PLR. The first two steps um, are performed under dark adaption, while the third one is performed under a rod suppressing blue adapting field. Okay, so from here in out, I will talk about the main metrics that could be um, that could be used to quantify specifically road cone and MRGC contribution to PLR. In particular, the road and cone ones and go under the name of the PLR matrix. And um, we can say that the MRGC contribution to the PLR could be quantified by the PIPR ones. Um, before calculating any metrics, uh, our data approach is to apply a median filter to remove the background noise and to remove the noise given by the eye blinking. Then the filtered pupil response traces are usually normalized by the median baseline pupil size in order to minimize the effects of the biological intersubject differences. And at this point, we can measure the PLR entity and its dynamic by way of two approaches. The first one based on real data. So we can um, calculate um, parameters like peak amplitude, contraction, or some timing, or average slope. And a second one based on data fitting. So um, the data fitting approach that um, allow us to estimate parameters like, for example, the constriction velocity. Here, we have these two parameters. So peak amplitude, um, which is defined as the difference between the normalized baseline and the minimum normalized pupil response curve after light stimulus onset, and the contraction onset timing, which is the timing taken to start pupil constriction from light stimulus onset. And by respecting these two parameters, um, a larger um, PLR will be the one with the higher, higher value of the peak amplitude. In addition, we can evaluate the average slope as a ratio 
between the peak amplitude and the time difference between the contraction peak timing and the contraction of the timing. And in this case, the average slope is indicative of the pupil of the pupil constriction velocity. So we will have a pupil that constricts faster for higher values of the average slope. Alternatively, we can use this data fitting approach, which consists of an exponential fitting of the constriction phase of the pupil response curve. So we compute parameter estimates, like for example, lambda, which is indicative of the pupil constriction velocity in the same way as before. So in the same way as the average slope. Now, here we have some established metrics to quantify specifically the intrinsically melanopsin retinal ganglion cell activity. Also, these metrics based on real data as well as on data fitting. The main metric of the intrinsic MRDC activity is PIPR, which is defined as the difference between the normalized baseline and the medium normalized pupil response curve. Um, calculated over the time interval between five and seven seconds from the stimulus offset and um, a specular metric to PIPR is also the AUC early, the area under the curve early, calculated in relation to the same time interval. And by respecting these two parameters, a larger melanopsin retinal ganglion cell sustained response will be the one with larger, larger values of PIPR or AUC early. Lastly, we could measure the dynamics of intrinsic melanopsin retinal ganglion cell activity with data fitting approach. So um, by fitting the data, and in particular fitting the data during the pupil regulation phase, and estimating the exponential coefficient of the fitted curve. And in this last case, smaller value of the redilation velocity uh, will be indicative of a larger melanopsin retinal ganglion cell sustained response. In conclusion, chromatic pupillometry can be used to assess functionality of roads cone and melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. We believe that chromatic pupillometry could be a, a powerful diagnostic tool to evaluate the retinal photoreceptor system functionality particularly for the MRGCs. And so we believe that the MRGCs functional, eva functional evaluation using this chromatic pupillometry may be proposed as an non-invasive, easily accessible and early biomarker of the MRGC dysfunction in neurodegenerative disorders, like for example, Alzheimer's disease, characterized by circadian and oral sleep dysfunction. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, let me see, is, uh, are there any particular questions at this point? No, that, that means I get to ask a question. Um, so that's really nice, thank you. And I, I think it's wonderful how you can really pull apart the contributions of the different photoreceptors. Um, now, I think to the pupillary light response, there is some circadian variation to that as well, or at least it's, it's related to sleepiness, isn't it, when you look at the delayed uh, pupillary light response. Um, have you looked at whether you can measure uh, that type of variation using this particular approach? So can you, can you uh, attribute that to either the rods or the combs or uh, the melanopsin retinal ganglion cells? Yeah. Yes, um, we think that uh, by using uh, this kind of technique, uh, there is the possibility to distinguish uh, um, separately uh, the functionality of um, each photoreceptor uh, system related to the pupillary light reflex. And in particular, um, it could be um, useful for study the MRGC dis dysfunction. Um, since uh, um, by using uh, uh, all three light stimulus condition in the, in the right way, 
we, we are able to, um, to isolate melanopsin retinal ganglion cell system efficiency. And uh, we can use this kind of measures. So uh, for example, um, we can quantify um, the PI, PR um, response efficiency as a marker of functionality of this photoreceptor system, I think. Yeah. Um, if I can just add in relation to your question about the, the potential use for in relation to drowsiness and so on, we didn't look specifically at this, but this can be a tool also for assessing the variation of the pupil, of course, in relation to vigilance and drowsiness. In order to have uh, comparable results uh, for uh, assessing our um, metrics, we did the, re the um, recording always at the same time of the day in order to, you know, uh, avoid the confounding of this uh, potential uh, role. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, dark adapted, I think, for most of these measures, right? So in the similar amount of time that you dark adapted. Ten, ten minutes uh, dark adaption. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. So that's really good. So that will really give you an opportunity to pull apart the different contributions. So that's, uh, that, that's very nice. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Anybody want to type in the chat or if you have a question, just speak out loud. No? Okay. Well, any other points uh, I'm, I'm sure will uh, we'll come up in the discussion later yeah. on as well. So, uh, yeah, Chiara, if you just want to go next with your presentation. Sure, thank you. Right. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. Perfect. Good afternoon to, to everybody. So, uh, I will start uh, from uh, the background. And uh, as uh, this morning beautifully was explained by Professor Foster, we do know that uh, the, uh, the process re regulating sleep is both. We do have an homeostatic component of sleep, which is building up over time during the day, but we also have the circadian component. And the circadian component of, of sleep is the um, product of this uh, um, entrainment of circadian rhythms um, by um, the retinohypothalamic tract, with, with, uh, which connect the eye to the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus, where is located also the master clock. And as we heard this morning, we do know that the period of circadian rhythms is slightly uh, uh, larger than 24 hours. So it's necessary that the light um, is entraining uh, this uh, uh, endogenous circadian rhythm. So these cells were discovered, the melanopsin containing retinal ganglion cells that we knew from the lecture this morning. Uh, they were discovered in 2002 and they are characterized by unique properties because they are intrinsically photosensitive, which means that even though they are separated from the rods and cones, they are still able to respond to light. And also they are able to project to the hypothalamus through the retinohypothalamic tract. Um, and uh, as we heard uh, this morning, uh, they, are, they have many functions. The most important functions are related to the circadian photoentrainment through the projection to the hypothalamus, but also sleep regulation and pupillary light reflex regulation. But don't forget that these cells, even though it's not the pri prior or um, pr primary uh, function, they are also contrib contributing to image forming functions. In fact, we do know that there are different subtypes of melanopsin retinal ganglion cells, and especially the M5, M6 subtypes, they are possibly contributing also to brightness detection and projecting to relevant structure for visual image processing. Uh, uh, single nucle nucleotide polymorphism in clock genes have been uh, previously associated with Alzheimer's susceptibility, and we do also know that OPM4, uh, which is the photopigment of melanopsin retinal ganglion cells variants, have been pre previously associated to seasonal affective uh, disorder, pupil response, but also circadian sleep wake timing and chronotype. 
So uh, based on the uh, knowledge that in Alzheimer's disease, uh, there is evidence of sleep and circadian dysfunction, but we do also know that there is optic nerve neurodegeneration. And since we know that melanopsin retinal ganglion cells are the main conduit for circadian photo entrainment, we uh, put this question um, for, forward, which is melanopsin retinal ganglion cells are possibly lost in Alzheimer's disease contributing to circadian and sleep dysfunction in dementia. So we uh, conducted this study, uh, which was published in 2016, and what we found in the post-mortem post optic nerve of Alzheimer patients, we, we did look both at the optic nerve and the melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. And what we found is a loss of optic nerve axons, which was not statistically significant because of high variability in the Alzheimer population as you can see from this optic nerve cross-section. You go from this very mild case with a very mild loss of fibers to this very profound loss of fibers. But when we look at the melanopsin density in, in post-mortem retinas from Alzheimer patients, we, do, we did observe a significant loss of melanopsin cells in post-mortem retinas. And there is also evidence of dendropathy affecting the cells, as you can see from these images. And we did demonstrate the presence of amyloid plaques in postmortem um, retinas, as we uh, observe in the brain of these patients. And when we, we uh, performed the cost staining of melanopsin and amyloid, we uh, were able to de demonstrate the co-localization of amyloid affecting specifically melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. So uh, we, uh, we thought that this uh, melanopsin retinal ganglion cell loss may contribute to circadian dysfunction and sleep problems in Alzheimer's disease. Based on these preliminary results, uh, we ran a more comprehensive study, which uh, was based on a multi-layered approach in which we performed a complete neuro-ophthalmological uh, evaluation. We evaluated also the rest activity rhythm by actigraphs. We performed a chromatic pupillometry, as Martina mentioned before, and we did uh, perform also brain functional MRI using light stimuli in a cohort of 29 Alzheimer patients and 26 controls. We also looked at genetic variants of clock genes, uh, since we know that this uh, can be relevant uh, as predisposing factor to Alzheimer. Uh, using a, a double approach, approach that was articulated in a discovery phase and a validation phase. So moving to the results of this uh, project, uh, we included 29 Alzheimer's and 26 controls. And as you can see, the disease duration was not so long and also the disease severity was not so uh, relevant because this was do due also to the fact that we needed to have compliance for uh, performing the examination. And when we look at the optic nerve uh, and the optic nerve fibers, were measured by optical coherence tomography, which is this instrument able to uh, quantify the loss of retinal nerve fiber layer at the level of the optic nerve. And uh, in the comparisons, in com comparison between controls and Alzheimer's, we did uh, find a significant loss of ganglion cell layer in the inferotemporal sector. Uh, we then look at the rest activity rhythm, mainly uh, using non-parametric analysis. And we did find a reduction of the total sleep time, uh, an increase of the total sleep time for the Alzheimer population and also of the uh, uh, actual wake, wake time. And we did find also an increase of the sleep latency. Overall, if you look at the graphs, there is a wide variability in the Alzheimer population. And this probably explain why we didn't find the significant difference in the terms of relative amplitude, interdaily stability, and intradaily variability of the circadian rhythm. But we, if we consider, consider the patients with the, uh, a deviation from the control population uh, more than two standard deviation, we observe um, the presence of a, a subgroup of Alzheimer patients that we define circadian impaired. 
Uh, overall, we observed also a worsening of circadian and sleep measurements with age. And in particular, the group per age interaction was significant for relative amplitude L5 and total activity score. Uh, we then look at the activity profile of these uh, patients uh, using a different technique. And we found also that uh, Alzheimer patients presented significantly lower motor activity between um, midnight to 2 a.m. and from 11 to uh, 2 p.m. Um, we also performed in this uh, uh, population uh, chromatic pupillometry that was uh, um, very, um, um, very uh, openly uh, discussed by Martina. And uh, so we used this uh, protocol, uh, um, including uh, 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 dark adaptation period and the uh, light stimuli uh, in order to isolate the contribution of cones, rods, and melanopsin to pupil response. Moving to the results, what we found is a significant reduction of the peak amplitude for the Alzheimer population in the rod condition. And even though we didn't find a re significant re reduction of the PPR, um, which was uh, which is uh, more most more specific of the melanopsin retina ganglion cells, we found the higher variance of the uh, PIPR in the Alzheimer uh, population. And also, this is relevant for the aging uh, issue. We found the significant correlation of the pupil pupillary light response. Uh, with age in, in only in the Alzheimer population. So overall, the pupillometry finds, uh, findings um, reinforces the concept of melanopsin retinal ganglion cell dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. We also um, used the, um, a brain uh, fMRI paradigm. Uh, you, and specifically, we used the um, uh, light stimuli uh, which were based on the alternation of the red and blue uh, flash. And if you look the, at the main results of this paradigm, the most important finding uh, is that uh, we didn't observe any significant activation of the occipital cortex with the sustained blue light stimuli in Alzheimer's disease. Moving to the genetic studies, uh, we performed this next generation sequencing approach using a, a multi-layered um, panel, which uh, included 84 clock genes. And uh, we performed the first a discovery phase with a smaller group of cases. And then this discovery phase was expanded to a larger cohort, which included almost 500 Alzheimer cases. And overall, the results uh, of this genetic approach showed that, that there was a, a significantly um, re revealed statistically significant differences only for a polymorphic variant in the PER1 gene. And specifically, if you look at the figure, the minor allele gene was protective for Alzheimer's disease. So overall, we can conclude that the OCT studies in this cohort of Alzheimer patients show the significant thinning of the inferotemporal ganglion cell layer thickness. And this points to an early pathology affecting the ganglion cells first and then the axons. Uh, we also uh, demonstrated the presence uh, by means of uh, rest activity rhythm evaluation of a circadian impaired subgroup of Alzheimer patients. We also observed a reduced peak amplitude in, of the PLR in the Alzheimer population, and these parameters declined with age in Alzheimer patients. By means of brain fMRI, we also uh, showed the absence of occipital cortex activation in Alzheimer's disease with blue light, and genetic studies uh, um, allowed us to uh, find a significant difference for this polymorphic variant in the PER1 gene. Overall, we can say that this uh, innovative multimodal approach, uh, the melanopsin system is affected in Alzheimer's disease by neurodegeneration, and this can possibly envisage also as a biomarker for conversion from MCI to Alzheimer's disease. And this has, of course, implication also for light thera therapy approach uh, as a counteractive measure for dementia. And with this, I would like to thank all the people contributing to the study, and in particular, Martina Romagnoli and Professor Carelli, and you for the attention.
Great, thanks very much. That was an enormous amount of different types of data in 15 minutes, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, it's, it's, you show with, the, with very nice detail that, um, so that there's a reduction in the, uh, the reto uh, hypothalamic tract uh, uh, to the SCN. And then of course, now in your actigraphy, um, you show that there is, um, uh, there's longer sleep, isn't there? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and somewhat reduced precision. Um, have you been able to, to uh, coarsely link those two together? Do you think it's the light entrainment of the SCN or do you think that the SCN itself, for instance, might show some effects of the neurodegenerative uh, issues as well? So what I can say is that it's impossible to isolate these two components from the results that we have. Yeah. These uh, results points to a circadian dysfunction. I'm referring to the circadian rhythm evaluation of these patients. And uh, with the pupillometry and brain fMRI, we can say that the connection between the eye and the hypothalamus is not working properly. But you know, in order to uh, be sure that this is just a matter of the connection between the eye and the SCN, you should be, be able to look also at the SCN. And uh, for example, for the post-mortem studies, we did not access, uh, have the access uh, to the hypothalamus of these patients. But this is something that I'm, uh, uh, I'm preparing for the future, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. yeah. And in your fMRI studies, could you see anything uh, in, in terms of SCN response uh, after light? Uh, is not possible in terms of resolution to look at yeah. the SCN. This is a, just a gross, you know, um, activation of the os occipital cortex, which is, as I said before, is not the most relevant uh, con contribution of the melanopsin cells, but it's relevant. So it's, uh, you know, a further demonstration of their involvement, but it's not possible to point at the SCN specifically. Yeah. Okay, uh, Marijke, uh, you have a question, I think. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, there are some indications that maybe in uh, with aging there is a change in uh, the uh, shift in the spectral sensitivity. It might be that elderly people are more sensitive to the green part of light. Um, have you tested different spectra with your pupillometry? Okay, so the data on the um changes of the pupil response uh, in relation to aging it, are a little bit controversial since there are some studies pointing to a decline of the pupil response by aging, but not all of them. So there is some discordance. Specifically referring to this uh, spectral sensitivity, you know that the cataract, because of the lens opacity, impinges on the spectral sensitivity and the, the yellowing of the lens can affect this. The protocol that we used is a specific protocol designed for the, the uh, isolation of melanopsin cells. So we are just using this very spectral um, design, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. just red and blue light. We didn't look specifically uh, to your yeah, yeah. point. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Marijke. Uh, Rohan, you have a question? Uh, yes, if I may. So... <clears throat> Really nice, really nice, informative presentation, Kara. Thank you very much for it. So a couple of questions. Um, one was, and perhaps you mentioned this, the rate of loss of the melanops and retinal ganglion cells in Alzheimer's, did you indicate that it was higher uh, as compared to just regular aging, which is also associated with the loss of photoreceptor density? This is a very important point. I didn't have the time to go through this, but uh, what we observed is that uh, uh, for axons, there is a, a age-related decline, which is uh, resembling what we observe in the control population. We do know that there is an age-related decline of optic nerve axons. But when we look at the melanopsin cells, this uh, uh, loss was age independent. So we demonstrated the presence of melanopsin so, uh, cell loss also at early ages, uh, which uh, uh, possibly suggests that, that, that there is a spe specific affection of these cells, which is uh, 
related to Alzheimer pathology and is independent from the aging process itself. This, uh, this was our interpretation. I, I understand, thank you. Um, and one more question was, do you intend to differentiate the rate of loss of the melanopsin retinal ganglion cells in Alzheimer's as compared to the loss of other photoreceptors? Mm. So there are no specific studies or not, no conclusive data on the affection of, for example, of rods and cones in Alzheimer's. What I can say from the OCT segmentation studies, uh, some people looked also at the photoreceptor component and they didn't find a specific affection of rods and cones. What is uh, well known that there is a specific affection of the dendritic connection between the rods and the melanopsin cells. And this explains our results on pupillometry because we found the reduction of the peak amplitude in the road condition, which means a dysfunctional interaction between rods, dendrites, and melanopsin cells. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, great. Um, I don't think I'm seeing any other questions at the moment. Um, more may come later, of course. Uh, Chiara, do you want to um, kind of round up this bit of the, the session uh, and give us some ideas about discussion and future perspectives? Uh, okay, absolutely. So, uh, you want to say something? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I will, in the meantime, I will share my screen so you can, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I have to change uh, the slides. <laughs> Just a second. Okay. Okay. Okay, I hope you can see. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, very good. So uh, the main message of this uh, uh, two presentation is based on uh, uh, emphasizing uh, this multi-layered approach that we used to investigate the impact of light on health, disease and well-being. So uh, I would like to emphasize uh, the multi-layered approach, uh, which was based uh, by uh, on a specific evaluation of the optic nerve, in particular with OCT. Then we use the, the actigraph for assessing the rest activity circadian rhythm, the pupillometry, chromatic pupillometry to evaluate the functionality of a single class of photoreceptor. We also use the uh, brain functional MRI to evaluate the, the uh, visual cortex response to light and also genetic studies to look at the specific polymorphic variants of the clock genes in association with Alzheimer. As Martina mentioned beautifully in her presentation, we do have this matrix, which allows to quantify in a very non-invasive, also it's a protocol which lasts 30 minutes, which means that for the patient, this is not very demanding. And also, you know, people affected by dementia as Alzheimer's patient are able to perform this uh, uh, kind of protocol. So uh, the future direction uh, are based on these uh, results uh, to apply this uh, multi-layered approach uh, to specifically look at the circadian biomarkers in relation to the functionality of melanopsin cells in other neurodegenerative disorders, also in, in, the term, in the sense of the conversion from MCI to Alzheimer, but potentially to other uh, neurodegenerative disorders uh, as Parkinson's disease, uh, REM behavior disorder, Huntington disease, uh, which are all characterized by circadian dysfunction. And uh, starting from, from this premise, uh, we can have some question, open question. So how much we can impact on changing the way artificial light is used? 
are we going to provide some clear cut guidance to urban policies for outdoor light? And what about indoor light? This is something that will be explored by uh, our project. Uh, this is, uh, as uh, Professor Foster, Foster said this morning, it, it's a very complicated field because uh, there are a lot of interaction in terms also of confounding that need to be taken into account. And also there is a very important biological uh, role of the uh, chronobi chronobiology uh, as uh, main um, uh, generator of this, um, uh, this approach. And now I will leave, um, okay, I can stop sharing, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, my voice is uh, very long, but um, uh, to follow a little bit the discussion, uh, I would like to say uh, that um, and this complex multi-layered approach obviously cannot be applied on a big numbers and these are specific studies. However, in our uh, ELACMI study, we extracted some of these things. And, uh, and the, the point is, if we will have uh, interesting results in terms of uh, circadian this alignment uh, that is impacted by the uh, intervention on outdoor and most importantly uh, indoor uh, lightning, uh, then we definitely can redesign in, in the future to understand uh, the details, the biological details uh, of the changes that we may observe uh, a better study using such a complex and multi-layered uh, approach. Uh, there is an obvious difference uh, in running actigraph, uh, actigraphic recordings, which is quite easy, uh, versus uh, running uh, functional MRI on everybody, which is very expensive. Uh, so uh, the point is, uh, once we get a signal, then we can get into the details with the specifically design study. And it, it would be nice to hear uh, what the people think of uh, this entire scenario. Uh, people uh, involved in the, in the field like Mareike, for example, or others. Uh, so please uh, go ahead with some comments. Yeah, you invite me, uh, Valerio. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want. I mean, currently we do not have these measurements um, uh, included in the in the study, right? Yeah. So it's of course it's true that we uh, it would be great if we could combine um, the the knowledge we obtain by by giving guidelines to the elderly in combination with. Um, and 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 then check those who respond to the to the guidelines with this kind of information, but um, I don't know whether it's pos still possible to uh, to do some of these measurements. It would be very interesting, of course. Yeah, at least in, maybe not in all of the people, but in some of them we can think about absolutely. I I expect that a uh, group of people will be interested to, uh, uh, to study better. So uh, of uh, 500, we are going to recruit in each city. Uh, maybe we can have a subgroup of people which is particularly prone to respond or which are particularly refractory uh, to respond to our intervention. So in a second stage study that we have to design from scratch, uh, we can actually go and, and apply this multi-layered approach yeah, to be, really understand. Would, would be great. Uh, we would know, learn much more if we could add those kind of measurements. Um, uh, yeah, another interest, very interesting population can be the centenarians. And actually, for my project, I was uh, able to record the three of them. 
and they are uh, you know over uh, 100 and they are uh, they have a robust or still robust uh, circadian rhythm and also the pupil was uh, properly functioning which okay. means you know yeah very uh, nice of uh, yeah longevity yeah I think what might also be very interesting is that, uh, Kara, what you show in, uh, in your presentation as well, so that these polymorphisms in, in clock genes, uh, of course, we are looking at that. Um, and uh, so that will give us some kind of indication whether there's some protective or, or advancing uh, um, um, role there for these genes. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, Don, I don't know how other people feel about that, is, um, how these clock genes would actually do that. Um, because, you know, the first thing is that comes to mind is, okay, it might be affecting the circadian clock in some way. But for instance, with period three, what we've been showing here in Surrey quite a bit, it seems to be that it's, it's non-clock related changes um, that are actually changing the sensitivity to light um, uh, and that then indirectly may affect your response to light, but it actually also indirectly make you more sensitive to other kinds of uh, uh, of, of syndromes or protect you against that. Um, so I don't know whether within our current study uh, we'll be able to look at that, but I think linking those two up, uh, um, where we have both the the response to the light exposure. Um, and the actigraphy, but also measures of subjective, uh, um, you know, how do people feel uh, and, and, and what does the light do for them? Uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. And then, as Valeria says, maybe we can use a subgroup um, of those people and, and look into that a little bit further. Yeah, we, actually, we have available this multi, uh, multi uh, panel. Uh, within, which include uh, uh, 84 clock genes, as I said before. And um, in the discovery phase, uh, uh, the OPM4, which is the photopigment uh, for melanopsin cells, uh, was actually one of the pot potential uh, candidates, but then uh, in the validation phase was not confirmed. And it's very interesting because uh, polymorphic variant of this OPM4 uh, have been associated to the seasonal affective disorder, which is uh, which has a very important circadian basis. Uh, so yeah, and this of course may affect the, the light, uh, the response uh, uh, to light of people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that would be very interesting. Just one, uh, one question. Um, and in the in these times of COVID, it's been difficult uh, in terms of recruitment for any human subjects, do you see such a multi-model approach can be applied to animal models with similar effectiveness? Yeah, I think it was applied uh, actually initially since the discovery of melanopsin cells in 2002, everything was based only uh, on animal, animal models. Uh, the problem is to apply this methodology to humans because uh, we don't have uh, uh, powerful tools uh, to assess in vivo melanopsin functionality. So yeah, I think uh, this 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 is uh, this is this is already studied and uh, evaluated uh, in animals. We have to do more for uh, tra translating this uh, on uh, humans. Thank you. Uh, if I can uh, summarize, uh, if we exclude post mortem which implies that someone is dead. <laughs> we only have two uh, major tools uh, for in vivo assessment of melanopsin cells, which is pupillometry and functional MRI. That's it. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in animals, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. in animals, uh, you can obviously sacrifice the animal at any stage and look at the eye and the brain, and it's much easier. Plus, you can switch on and off, eliminate a gene, After the over express a gene, and you can play around a lot. And it has been done. Uh, but uh, I think we pioneered the field of melanopsin cells applied to humans, which is much, much more difficult. Yeah, there is also a lot of discussion about the way to isolate the melanopsin contribution in functional MRI studies. 
there is this methodology which is called the silent substitution, which is uh, something that we are trying to uh, to set up because uh, for the, uh, for example, for the methods that we used uh, for brain fMRI, there is a kind of overlapping between uh, the three class of photoreceptors, which is not easy to isolate. Correct. Yeah. Of course, the rodent rod cone system is quite different uh, from uh, from that of humans as well. So that makes the translational value uh, a little bit more difficult. Uh, as well as genetic variation is, is, is quite uh, often different. Although you can do it the other way around. So you can take a human polymorphism and, and build that uh, into a mouse system. But I agree that the real challenge here is, and, and you're certainly addressing that, is, is looking in humans uh, and, and what the contribution is there. Uh, and of course, in the context of this project, um, I agree that it will probably be difficult to recruit people, but I think really the core of what we're trying to do is really look at humans in a real world environment, uh, which is uh, which makes it complex again, but actually quite exciting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, any other pressing matters that people want to add at this point? No? Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, so what I think we'll do is uh, we'll just take a, um, a let's say, a, a five minute break, if that's okay for everybody. And we'll come back at uh, half past three European time. Yeah, half past two for me. Um, uh, and then we'll start with the second half of, uh, of today's session. All right. So see you in five minutes. Hello again to everybody. So we can start with the second part of the session. So it's a pleasure to introduce, I hope to pronounce well, Jan Denman from the Good Light Group. Please. Uh, okay. I think you are mute. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah we can see. Okay. But can, yeah. Just put, uh, you know, as um, uh, full screen. You have to put the slides full, as full screen. This is, I put it now on full screen, you know. Uh, now we, we just see the single slides, you know, but not the um, open version. If you go on at the bottom, uh, you should be able, yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to, uh, to give a short presentation of the uh, effects that good light have on people's health and well-being. Now I need to move my screen. Oh, yay. Yeah, um, <laughs> now it works, sorry for that. Yeah, uh, I'm one of the founders of the Good Life Group. That's a nonprofit organization. And the reason for us to start this group is that uh, there is already a wealth of knowledge about the uh, effects positively or negatively that light has on uh, health and well-being. Uh, but this is not known yet to the general public. And consequently, it's not used to improve the indoor lighting situations. Uh, and the objective of the Good Light Group is to make this knowledge uh, available for the grand public, uh, so they will understand, firstly. And we assume then 
that uh, if people understand, uh, they would design their indoor spaces differently, uh, taking light into consideration. And we do this via conferences uh, uh, like this one, but this one uh, probably is not needed because all of you are convinced about the importance of light, I guess. Yeah? But you also try to do this for more for the general public, people that are not yet aware. Um, this, this is the content of my presentation. Um, since most of the people in the world live and work with insufficient light, it has certain consequences. Our bodies basically need light. Um, and then the next part is uh, how to get your daily dose of vitamin L and some guidance. Um, in the fabulous keynote speech of uh, Russell Foster this morning, he touched already on, on several important aspects of circadian rhythm, sleep, well-being, and so on. And at the end of his speech, he said that in order to have evidence-based guidance for real uh, human-centric lighting, more research is needed to answer many of the unanswered questions. Of course, that's true. Uh, and projects like uh, Enlight, we uh, are just doing that. But in the Good Light Group, we believe that there is already enough knowledge so that we can give that to the people so that they can already start improving their indoor light situation or their light situation. Of course, we can always adapt guidelines eh, when new knowledge becomes available. But with what we know already, we can make a, a big leap in the way that people uh, can personally control their own circadian rhythm. So that's basically also the, uh, uh, I'll show this in the presentation, how we would do this. First of all, um, most of the people live and work with insufficient light. If we go back a couple of hundred years ago, uh, during daytime, people were most of the day outdoor in natural daylight. And today, uh, more than 90% of the people do have an indoor job and are refrained, shielded from national daylight. It has a huge consequence about how well we can synchronize our internal clock. Uh, and definitely this, uh, this was a process that was speeded up after the Industrial Revolution uh, 250 years ago. Good light improves sleep, improves as a consequence of that, the energy level during daytime and the mood of people, especially in this time of the year, it becomes uh, known to many people that they really have a lack of light. And, they, and many people start developing kind of uh, winter blues, winter depressions, uh, uh, at least feelings of winter depressions. Like Florence Nightingale already said in the past, a dark house is always an unhealthy house. And this does not only yield for houses, it also yields for university buildings, it yields for uh, hospitals. Uh, it's also true for schools, basically everywhere where people have an indoor daytime activity. And our bodies need light. I don't have to tell you because of the, uh, the way that life has evolved on earth, for millions, hundreds of millions of years, uh, we already had to cope with the fact that the Earth rotates around its axis, uh, so that you had to deal with parts of the 24-hour cycle that were dark and parts that were light. And light enters our eyes and goes and helps us to see uh, things uh, with the rods and the cones. But light also has an influence on our well-being. Uh, Basically, light tells us how late it is eh, and makes us uh, energetic during the day and sleepy at night. Light, as a matter of fact, is the most important factor in keeping our biological clock in sync or not. The daily light cycle affects the rhythm of our bodies. And there are three types of consequences. If your circadian rhythm is 
nicely in tune, synchronized with the 24 hour clock, you probably have a better night's sleep. As a consequence, during the daytime, you have more energy. And it definitely supports also to your health and productivity during daytime. So what to do about that? Um, we have defined four steps to good light or to vitamin L, as we call it. First of all, people must become aware about uh, the light levels they are sitting in. And so the easiest thing is to, uh, to start a kind of, to uh, install a kind of a uh, lux meter or your, uh, this is a real lux meter, but uh, you also have devices that you can install on your smartphone and start measuring it and start comparing outdoor with indoor. Uh, and especially uh, get the feeling uh, that the light that comes into your eye is not always the light that comes at your desk. So if you start measuring it, you can start playing around with it. And then make sure that uh, at working, you have good light. Locate indoors your desk within a meter from the window. And if that's not possible, that's not possible in all situations, uh, make sure that you increase the electrical light level to at least thousand lux entering in your eye, entering your eye. Because with thousand lux, you probably have enough melanopic luxes uh, that start becoming, uh, triggering effectively the IPRGCs for the little spheres in your net, net in your retina. The third point is, live by the 2022 rule, especially because we are almost entering 2022. Uh, uh, 2022 rule is after every 20 minutes of working concentrated at a laptop or whatever you do, yeah, look 20 seconds to the sky. Because in our eyes, those uh, new uh, third photoreceptors, they're basically blue sky detectors. And that gives the information to your brain to uh, set the clock, the master clock. And the two is spend at least two hours outdoors every day, preferably in the morning. And last but not least, get our good light guide at goodlightgroup.org. And I disclose a little bit about what, what the content of the good light guide is. Yeah? Basically, uh, uh, half an hour of good light yeah, after waking up is much better than taking sleeping pills before going to sleep. And what is good light? Vitamin L or good light. Good light is daylight or electric light with beneficial effects on body and brain. And I said, the best good light is daylight. Because daylight is on and off at the right time, always, every day. And daylight has the right spectrum every day. And daylight has the right intensity at every moment of the day. So there's nothing better than daylight, especially morning light, to make sure that you have a lunch walk and play or sport outdoor and not in a gym. Yeah? Children definitely need to be two hours outdoors every day. And of course, protect your uh, skin from too much direct sunlight. And the next best is enclose indoors and be close to a window uh, or electric good light. And now we come back to the electric good light uh, because the, the big issue is yeah, that outdoor lux levels during daytime are always more than 5,000 lux. And indoor reaching the eye are always less than 1,150 lux. Uh, the sweet spot indoor is make sure that you get thousand lux in your eye. And there are four, there are more aspects. For example, uh, the light indoor need to be attractive uh, by maximum daylight entry, uh, but you also need to increase the brightness in rooms to create attractive contrast levels. The light indoor, the electric light needs to be dynamic, at least thousand lux entering your eye vertically. Uh, so at least 500 melanopic luxes. Uh, 
And the dimming should be possible for evenings and nights. It should be optimized so that indeed you get during a couple of hours those 500 mediluxes. Uh, and that depends on your age. We heard it in the earlier presentations today, uh, your activity. And the spectrum should be tuned or tunable. And last but not least, it should also be personal. It should be, uh, must be possible by the person to adjust it to their specific activities. Um, personal good light uh, versus uh, increasing the general light levels in buildings. All the lighting in buildings are focused today on uh, vision, on creating an ambience and creating uh, safety aspects if you don't fall over something. Of course, that's very important, but it really caters for the vision center in the brain. But for the health center in the brain, yeah, the master clock, nothing has been arranged for in the indoor light. So we believe that especially going uh, with a focus to personal good light for indoor is, is, is a way to go. Um, and this was also, I think, a picture that was shown earlier today, I think also by Russell Foster, about the, uh, the scientific study that explains uh, a little bit, yeah, that is a summary of, uh, I think, at least 10 or 15 uh, scientific publications that indeed says that the usual indoor situations are not high enough to go beyond the threshold in which the IPRGCs are really start working and firing time signals to the SEN in the brain, to the master clock in the brain. If you want to need to know more, we have a, uh, a summary of this uh, summarized in the infographic. It's called the healthier and happier life. And we also have a more extended good light guide. So and if you want to have more information, please uh, contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Let me see if there is any question. Uh, On this first. OK. Uh, hi, Jan. Thank you for a nice presentation. Um, I think Marijke mentioned you several times in our meetings before, so it's nice to finally meet you. Um, I was wondering about something you mentioned about the Lux Meter app, if I got it correct, because in the current project, we're thinking about maybe using an app with the participants to kind of get an idea of where the light is coming from in their living room. So I was wondering if this is something that maybe we could use by using your app maybe. So maybe you could explain a little bit more about the specific and features that it has. Um, yeah, there, there are quite a few light meter apps on, on smartphones. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the, they, they are pretty incurate, uh, inaccurate if you compare it to a, uh, a real light meter. Yeah? Uh, but it, order of magnitude, it's, it's okay. And uh, I think it's really important that people start understanding that the light levels outdoor are always a factor at least 10, if not 100 times higher than indoor. And that kind of differences you can always, uh, you can even also detect with a poor quality light meter app on smartphones. And, and both for Android and for uh, iPhone, iOS systems, there are now a few uh, uh, types that, that are really okay uh, according to some comparison with, with a real with a real lux meter. Yeah. And of course it only measures lux, that is measure maybe lux. Uh, but, but if you assume that all the LED lights yeah, indoor have at least 50% uh, melanopic content, and you can guesstimate what type of light gets into your eye. Yeah, but like you said, it's only actually measuring the luck. So it doesn't give you any extra information on where it's coming from, per se. Okay. No, Thank you. No, no, no. But you probably can see that where it's coming from. Yeah, sort of. But we're really talking about it. If you can <laughs> you take pictures not, or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's not a big mystery yet. It's all coming directly from, uh, from the sky, from clouds, or from through the window, or through a lamp. Yeah. Uh, and if you can't see the lamps, yeah, or the light shining, it doesn't come to your eyes. So uh, I think it's uh, it, it, it's simple to to find out where the light is coming from. 
Thank you. Hi, um, if, if you don't mind me asking, yeah. thank you for, for that presentation. That was really nice. Um, now, my watch is already telling me I need to do 10,000 steps a day, um, but I can't find any evidence uh, why it should be 10,000. So I was just curious, why do you say that 1,000 lux is, is really that, that point where it becomes good light? Yeah, for the same reason as 10,000 steps is also healthy. Yeah. So we know that uh, all indoor environments, yeah, you get only max yeah, in, in the best lit office, yeah, if you're not close to a window. And most of the people are not sitting close to a window. In the best lit office, you get 100, 120 lux at eye level. And people say that they get depressed and don't get energized from that lighting situation. So that's far too low. Yeah? The, um, the, the study yeah, of the Manchester Conference guys yeah, uh, said 250 medilux. But, but those are scientists and they're probably too um, prudent. So we said 500 medilux, 1000 lux. Yeah? And let's start with that. Yeah? Because if we would, why would we not start with, uh, so, and if people find out that 800 uh, uh, lux or 400 medilux is also well enough, be my guest. But I don't see the point why we even should investigate that. Yeah? Uh, if 1000 lux does the job, yeah, uh, 500 medilux, eh? be happy. Yeah. 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 No, and absolutely. Especially if you, do that, if you do that with personal good light, uh, it's, it, it's close. Eh? Put the light more closely to your eyes. Eh? It's also, from a sustainability point of view, a very acceptable proposal. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is a lot less than what you re receive outside, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think um, I personally always have a situation yeah, with um, yeah. Yeah, more than 2,000 looks and I feel very happy. Yeah? Mm. Yeah? And 2,000 looks, there's, there's nothing uh, against 2,000 looks because now outdoor in Holland, yeah, the, the, it's partly sunny. Yeah? I just measured it before we started. It was 6,000 looks. Yeah, in the shadow, in the sun, yeah, the sun is also out, uh, 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 it was 12,000 yeah? yeah. So indeed, uh, so it, it's still nothing, yeah? But, uh, but, but my personal experience and also all the evidences of the Manchester conference at uh, the 18 people uh, said uh, 250 maybe lux would work. I think it's on the, on, the, on the safe side. Let's start with 500. If we want to make a change in the world, you need to make a big change, yeah? and not a, a too small change so that people don't experience the beneficial effect of good light or vitamin L. Yeah. So it's to be on the safe side, but still be sustainable. Oh yeah, you, you, you would recommend higher. No, 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 I'm just curious. It's uh... <laughs> Join the group. If you yeah. need arguments uh, to, to increase light levels indoor, at least uh, where people are. Yeah. in the neighborhood of people. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, there is another question, I think from Marike and then also Siak. Yeah, okay. I just want to add something uh, to uh, Jan, but he answered already uh, very uh, complete, I think. The thousand lux, I mean, uh, several groups have tried to make a dose response curve to light intensity during daytime. And that seems to be very difficult. Um, and if you want to do uh, a meta-analysis or so, it's still very difficult to find indeed the appropriate um, intensity. What is the minimum? Uh, the brown paper recommendation says 250. Uh, at the same time, we were developing these guidelines and we started a little bit higher. And because it also depends on age, um, we started off with 1,000 photopic lux, um, uh, also because uh, it's not clear it, it depends a little bit from your light source how much melanopic lux that is. Um, and this is just a choice between a pragmatic um, public recommendation and the real basic science. And if we have to adapt at a certain moment to 800 lux or to 500 lux, uh, we will be happy to do that. But I think that's why the good light group made this choice. So that was only what I wanted to add. Uh, there is uh, also another 
person wants to speak. So uh, first, uh, Siak, you can, yeah. All right, yeah, thank you. So as most of us working a lot of time indoors, I guess also a lot of things we gaze at are the screens of our laptops and computers or screens in general. Um, of course, how much light you perceive depends a lot on gaze directions. Would you say it would be a wise decision to increase screen brightnesses for these types of purposes? Or is it important that it's the whole environment and multi-directional um, light intensity? Clouded looks in your eye, yeah, that would work as well. Uh, but that's, I think, not possible. Yeah, uh, and the, the screen will not be uh, uh, really pleasant to read. Yeah, so I don't think that the solution is in screens themselves, but it is the environment around the screens. For example, what I demonstrated here, yeah, uh, with, uh, where you can get the light in the pleasant way still in your eye. Well, not being disturbed, looking at your screen and seeing all the nuances on the screen. So I don't think that it is, uh, that it, that it is wise to increase screen levels to, go to, to those high levels so that you get really far from looks at high level. All right. Yeah, thank you. And the last, because we have to move then uh, to the other presentation, uh, last question from Rohan. Um, thank you. Uh, Chan for the nice presentation. I think um, <clears throat> on the other side, on the other side, or perhaps one of the challenges of increasing the light levels indoors is the distribution of the light fixtures itself. When you compare outdoors to indoors, a 6,000 lux outdoor is extremely diffuse light. Uh, that's why it doesn't pose as much of a glare or, or discomfort to to all the people, but it is possible that a thousand lux from a very uh, narrow distribution indoor light source can pose that challenge in terms of glare. Uh, <clears throat> that's something that should be taken into design considerations. Um, and we also have to take note that thousand lux, I agree, is great for your entrainment in terms of getting daylight exposure, but there are several other parameters like in terms of what is what is best for your alertness and mood, right? So <clears throat> that that definition of good light needs to be dynamic and not static in terms of the application. Fully agree. So that that's also what we what we said in our uh, good light guide. Eh? We need to mimic daylight as good as possible, uh, especially the positive aspects of daylight. Like you said, yeah, uh, daylight is much more pleasant from a uh, intensity point of view and a contrast point of view than, than usually indoor lighting solutions. Eh? And it should be dynamic and it should be optimized and it should be personal. And so those were the four aspects where we thought that um, uh, daylight yeah, is so much appreciated by many people and we need to mimic daylight indoor. Yeah? Uh, and, we, and we defined four aspects that if you read the full guide, then you see uh, that you took that into consideration. Thank you. Okay. So now I can introduce uh, Rohan Nager, I hope I pronounced good. And the title of the presentation is Calculation Tools for the Circadian Effectiveness of Light, a Comparison, please. Thank you. I put the presentation on the full screen mode. Is it visible to everyone? Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So good. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rohan uh, from the Light and Health Research Center at the Ikan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And on behalf of our team at the Light and Health Research Center, I would like to take this opportunity to share an overview of some of the prominent tools that have been used or could be used to calculate and compare the circadian effectiveness of different light sources. 
just a quick background on how the definition of light has evolved over the past two to three decades. And historically, light has been defined and discussed and specified in terms of and in the context of the visual responses of the long wavelength and the middle wavelength photoreceptors or the central photoreceptors as characterized by the photopic luminous efficiency function or the B lambda. And it is a general understanding that under ambient operating environments, for most tasks, an increase in stimulation to those LNM cones can ensure an increase in visual performance. But the spectral sensitivity for the circadian system is quite different as compared to the human visual system. And the investigations leading to characterize the spectral sensitivity for the circadian system have revealed that all photoreceptors participate in circadian phototransduction and that the melanopsin containing intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are the primary conduits that transfer and relay the photic signals from the retina to the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus. It has also been shown with the animal studies that these IPRDCs also integrate, receive and integrate the signals from cone bipolars that also share pathways with rod photoreceptors. <clears throat> of particular note here is that the spectral sensi sensitivity for the human circadian si system uh, peaks at a short wavelength op optical radiation. Uh, as is evident in the plot at the bottom right here, which depicts the spectral sensitivity estimates from the two landmark studies by Brainerd uh, et al. and Tappan et al. conducted in, 19, in 1990s, which showed a peak spectral sensitivity at close to 460 nanometer, which is quite different from the peak sensitivity for the human visual system at close to 555 five, five, uh, nanometer. I would also like to highlight from the same plot uh, is that you can see a blue curve which depicts a spectral efficiency function as proposed by Ray and colleagues, which are part of our lab at the Light and Light Research Center, indicating that the indicating a sub-additivity in human circadian phototransduction, uh, which is evident from the trench in this plot. And this sub-additivity is consistent with the spectral opponency involved in human color vision formation. <clears throat> now, in terms of the absolute sensitivity, it is now well established that the human circadian system requires a higher, has established a higher activation threshold as compared to the human visual system, wherein you can easily read black font and white paper in low light levels, but your circadian system can still remain in blindness. But however, it is, it is still a work in progress in terms of precisely understanding how much circadian effective light you should get during the daytime and to what extent you should avoid the circadian effective light during the nighttime uh, to, to maintain and entrain circadian rhythm. And nevertheless, there are several quantitative tools that have surfaced over the past few years that can be used to at least uh, quantitatively compare and relatively rank order the circadian effectiveness of different light sources. And I'll be just sharing some characteristics of three of these prominent tools today over the course of next few slides. Um, one of them is the melanopic ratio spreadsheet developed by the International Well Building Institute. The other is the Luox app, which is a web tool developed by Spitz Chan and colleagues in collaboration with the Go Free range. And this Luox app uh, is, also, is based upon the recent CIE technical note on the non-visual effects of light. And I will also be discussing the CS Calculator 2.0 developed by the Light and Health Research Center based upon the retinal neurophysiology published by Ray and colleagues on circadian phototransduction. So starting with the melanopic ratio spreadsheet, 
uh, it's a pretty straightforward tool when the only input that you give to the spreadsheet, uh, and this is the master page for the spreadsheet, and the only input on the user end is that you see you select the source. And that source uh, can be one of the inbuilt spectral power distributions. So for instance, this particular holonopic ratio spreadsheet has six sample SPDs preloaded, and you can choose one of choose one of them. And the CCTs for these sources range from 2700 Kelvin to 6500 Kelvin. There is also a sample for daylight under overcast conditions. And user has also the provision to add their own SPDs. Just going back, so once a user selects a spectral power distribution or the source, uh, the output for the spreadsheet is a melanopic ratio. And that melanopic ratio is calculated by, divide, by dividing the sum of the weighted circadian components by the sum of the weighted, the vigil components in the spreadsheet. And this melanopic ratio can then be used um, to calculate other parameters such as the melanopic lux or the melanopic EDI, which is equivalent daylight illuminance by simply multiplying uh, the, by it by the photopic illuminance and an appropriate scalar. Moving on to, uh, before I move on, just a spe some specific notes on this spreadsheet. And one of the good things that I found about the spreadsheet was that you can easily download that Excel sheet and save it locally. An advantage of that is that the user can add as many SPDs to that sheet and save them for any future use. So you don't have to add a uh, light source every time you have to perform some computation for an old file. Um, however, a limitation is that when you enter that, that file, it has to follow a specific uh, wavelength increments. And for this case, it is only five nanometer wavelength increments. Uh, and you can only add one light source at a time. So there is no overlapping of different lighting scenarios in it. Moving on to the next tool, which is the Luox app from by Delo by the Spitz Chan and colleagues. And here is a screenshot of that web tool. So in this case, you don't have any inbuilt spectral power distributions or light sources that you can load. Uh, so instead you have to find a file locally and upload it and can be a CSV or it can be a SPDX which is um, an approved format by the IES to share spectral data. And once you upload that file, you actually have to select whether it's an absolute spectral power distribution or a relative spectral power distribution. If it is a relative spectral power distribution, you also have to mention the four topic illuminances for each of the measurements with a minimum of one measurement. If it's an absolute spectral power distribution, then you have to mention the irradiance units, which is watts per meter square in this case. And once these parameters have been input, then the user can just verify whether the spectral power distribution uh, for the light source entered is accurate or not in the step three. Moving on to the output for the Luox app, this screen, this another screenshot showing all the outputs and there are lots of it. So starting with the illuminance and you can see the Luox app also displays the chromaticity coordinates. And the more important outputs from this app are all the alpha opic irradiances for the five photoreceptors and also the five alpha opic, sorry. And also the five alpha opic illuminances or the alpha opic EDI values. Lastly, if you have entered a relative spectral power distribution, this tool allows you to download the absolute spectral power distribution, which you can save locally. And it also allows the users to kind of um, share a version of this report online and save it for any future validation. Some specific notes on the Luox app. So as I mentioned, it's a web-based tool that you can that can be used to save, share, and publish uh, the, the displayed results. You can, user can 
enter both the relative and the absolute spectral power distribution. Again, however, the calculation is always limited to a single light source or a single SPD. Uh, so there is no overlapping lighting scenes, uh, but there's flexibility in terms of how you enter the user SPD. So it's not tied to any uh, wavelength increment. So between one to 10 nanometer integer wavelength increments can be entered. Um, and it does not, as I mentioned, it does not have any inbuilt sample SPDs, but it does provide one sample SPD, which is available for download and testing. So moving on to the last tool, which is a CS calculator 2.0. Uh, <clears throat> so in, in, for this CS calculator 2.0, the input is again, an S, the spectral power distribution for a light source. And there are two ways. That, that can be entered. One is you can select any one of the 46 inbuilt light sources or SPDs of varying CCTs. It also includes some of the common daylight sources such as D65, D50. Um, um, and it includes not just the LED light sources, but it also includes comparison across different type of light fixtures, so incandescent lamps, high pressure lamps. Or the user can also simply copy paste uh, the SPD into the input file. Uh, so if you have a text file or a CSV file that can be copied into this tool. Uh, so once the user put, selects a light source, he has to enter the photopic illuminance. And once the photopic illuminance is entered, this is the output of all the different metrics that come with on the, dis um, that have been displayed. So. You can start with the most important in this particular screen is a CS, which is the circadian stimulus. And, and the circadian stimulus is analogous to light induced suppression of the hormone melatonin during the nighttime and under the regular operating conditions. So if you don't change any of other metrics and I'll get back to some advanced controls. So under default, um, tool conditions, what it indicates is that a one hour of exposure to 300 lux of this particular light source will suppress melatonin suppression by almost 24% compared to a dim light control light. So it has some biological significance in terms of the effectiveness of this light source. Uh, <clears throat> it also outputs several other tools such as the illuminance, the irradiance, the photon flux, uh, as similar to other tools, <clears throat> similar to other tools, uh, so, apologies. Similar to the two tools earlier, it also offers a melanopic uh, EDI, and it also outputs all the alpha opic irradiances. One of the advantages of this particular CS calculator is that it not only outputs the circadian metrics, but it also has tons of color metrics into it. So it's kind of a, a one place solution for all the designers and the specifiers. A uh, few things that are very unique about this tool is that one is that it offers the user to download the data. So there's a key over here that allows the user to download all the calculations, which can be reloaded into the tool and it's not a static reload. So user can again, edit that previous calculation file. Another advantage of the calculation calculator is that it allows a combined SPD. So a user can actually add multiple light sources and can change the ratio of them within a space to see how overlapping light scenes can interact and affect all these parameters that shown here. Uh, last important thing that I would like to highlight here is that there's a way to back calculate what should be the design light level for a space. So you can enter, for example, I need to achieve a CS of 0.3 as recommended by the UL24480 standard to promote circadian entrainment in day working people. So they recommend that a CS of 0.3 during daytime is what you should be targeting. So if I put the light source and I put CS of 0.3, it will tell me what should be the light level at the eye. And this is just a summary of what I just mentioned and I covered all of that, so let me skip. This is a summary of all the three tools and what they output. Again, the 
the, the LUOX app has all the alpha opic irradiances and the alpha opic equivalent daylight elements values, which is what has been defined in the recent CI technical note. The CS calculator 2.0 has all the tools, all the output metrics from the LUOX app, and it adds or uh, it also adds the CS metric, which has translation in, in an absolute biological domain, and it also has all the color metrics in it. To compare these quantitative tools, we also performed uh, we, we also performed a direct quantitative comparison when we took two spectral power distributions, a 2700 Kelvin source and a 4000 Kelvin source, uh, both from the default SPDs from the melanopic ratio spreadsheet. And we wanted to compare the outputs and particularly the melanopic EDI and how it varies across three different tools for 18 lux at the eyes, which is a typical light level ex experience while standing at a distance of 10 meters from a street light in urban environments. And <clears throat> what we found that the three tools were quite similar in terms of the accuracy of the outputs. The chromatizy coordinates were not available in the melanopic ratio, but for the LUOX app and the CS calculator 2.0, the error, the error was less than 0.2%. Moving on to the melanopic EDI, uh, the CS calculator only outputs the integer values for the EDI, and that resulted in an error of about 4% as compared to the other tools. But when you compare the melanopic irradiance, which offer a similar uh, degree of precision in terms of the decimals, that error was, was, that error was less than 0.02% again. And only the CS calculator 2.0 could output um, the CS in terms of the 2700 Kelvin source, 18 lux at the eye translated to a CS of 0.016. Uh, in other words, a one hour exposure through that street light will result in 1.6% melatonin suppression. And the 4000 Kelvin light source will similarly lead to a 2.5% suppression. So to conclude with, of all the tools that have been investigated, all the tools are freely available for use. It was found that in terms of the, in terms of the number of metrics available as the output, the CS calculator 2.0 provides the most comprehensive evaluation, including metrics for not just circadian, but color metrics as well. The CS metric <clears throat> uh, analysis for 18 lux at the eye uh, outputted the values of less than 3% melatonin suppression or a CS value of less than 0.03 for both a 2700 Kelvin and a 4000 Kelvin source. And it has been and based upon publications involving CS metric, it has been shown that a value of 0.1 or lower is below the threshold for activation for the human circadian system. And thus it can be, it's, it, thus it can be concluded that 18 lux at the eye from any of the white light street lights uh, will have a minimal impact on the circadian system, especially for the very brief duration that a person spends underneath or walking towards it. And lastly, when we compare the, quant the quantitative predictions for the melanopic EDI from the different tools, it was found that the error across the three tools was less than 0.02% uh, when the degree of decimal precision was the same. With that, I would like to conclude the talk and I would like to convey my thanks to the conference organizers for the opportunity to present these data. And there's this disclosure when I would like to disclose that the CS calculator 2.0 has been developed by the members of the Light and Health Research Centers, Light for Human Health Partnership. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much for this interesting um, presentation. Let me see if there is any question from the audience. Apparently not. So um, may I ask you something? Uh, so this, um, these tools were already, I, I assuming that they are already tested for you know, specific uh, uh, assessment of the circadian effectiveness of light. Is that right? It have been applied also to uh, clinical studies and yeah? 
Yes, um, you, you, are, you are correct. These tools have been applied to clinical population. Just mm -hmm. for example, from our the development of CS Calculator 2.0 from our lab at the Light and Health Research Center, we have performed studies involving school kids as well as on the other end of the spectrum, which is the Alzheimer's population. Mm -hmm. And specifically for the Alzheimer's population, we have shown that a CS or the circuit in stimulus of 0.3 or greater during the daytime and a circuit in stimulus less than 0.1 during the evening hours actually helps the Alzheimer's patients sleep better, improves their rest activity rhythms, they're more entrained, there are less nighttime wanderings, decreased agitation, and a decrease in depression scores. And okay. the important... Sorry, go ahead, sorry. Uh, and one important thing that we would like to mention here is that when it's important to use a metric such as CS because then we do not have to rely on photopic illuminance as the only marker, so as, uh, as the only stimulus, because to achieve a CS of 0.3 with an incandescent lamp, you probably need 500 lux at the eye, so at least 1,000 lux on a horizontal plane. But in our studies, we have shown that a CS of 0.3 can also be achieved by only 30 lux of blue light or a narrowband blue LED light source. So it allows more design flexibility when we balance not just the amount of light, but also the spectrum. See, yeah, to adjust also taking into account the spectral sensitivity. And also I would like to ask you how long was the duration of the light therapy, for example, for the study that you mentioned, because uh, as we heard uh, this morning, it's very important also that we have a quite you know, long stimuli in order to, uh, to have a, a good response of the melanopsin cells. You can comment also on this? Yes, uh, absolutely. So the duration of light exposure of, or the duration of that stimulus during the daytime, we have varied from two hours to throughout the daytime. So, so the minimum that we have always recommended is you should have a CS of 0.3 when you get up uh, for at least two hours. Okay, there is a question also from uh, Jan. Go ahead. Hello, Ron. Thank you very much. Very interesting overview about the, the whole CS system. Um, CS is that now based on CIE standards nomenclature or not? Or, uh, or not? Uh, so, 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 getting stimulus uh, is a is analogous to a biological phenomenon, like I mentioned, the melatonin suppression. And it has recently, uh, if I may speak a bit, little bit more on that. So melatonin suppression induced by light exposures during the nighttime, uh, following one hour of exposure. And <clears throat> this, this metric of CS of 0.3 during the daytime for at least two hours has, has recently uh, been adopted by a, the UL standard 24480 which is geared towards how to maintain daily circadian rhythms and optimum entrainment in day shift working populations. But to your question, it has not yet been validated by CIE. Okay, yeah. Okay, very good. If there are no other questions, we can move to the last presentation, which is light and well-being, well-being, a genetic point of view. And uh, this presentation uh, will be uh, will be given by Anne Lambregut. <laughs> I hope uh, it's it's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can you all see my screen in the right way? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So hi everyone, thank you for joining today. Um, my name is Anna Landberg and I work at the Free University of Amsterdam and I am a PhD in the Enlightenment Project together with Professor Michael Bartels. And our main aim in this project is to assess the association between light and well-being. So in this presentation, I will talk to you about two things. Um, first, I'd like to talk to you about why we're actually studying the association and why we think it's necessary to study light and well-being together. 
And then in the second part, I will talk to you about a new project that we're working on simultaneously to the Enlightenment project, which is very much related and is about the association between circadian rhythm and well-being, but taken more from a genetic point of view. So first, why do we think it's necessary to study light and well-being? Well, as you all know, light influences the circadian rhythm and uh, the circadian rhythm would naturally follow a 24-hour cycle um, that kind of follows the sunset and the sun, uh, sunrise and sunset. But since the introduction of artificial lighting in the 20th century, um, this has changed uh, drastically for us. So as you can imagine, nowadays we can have our phones on or our screens on when we're watching Netflix uh, until deep until the middle of the night. But also think about the artificial lighting that we use to keep stores open, which enables us to go outside when we should, act, should actually be asleep. And the same goes, of course, for the traffic lights, which enables us to traffic more safely while normally we would be asleep during those late hours. Um, these changes all have uh, caused a circadian disruption and with a pretty word that's called circadian misalignment. And circadian misalignment basically means that whatever's happening in your environment is not in line with what your body would naturally want. So as you know, there have been plenty of studies that study the association between light circadian rhythm and physical health. So classic examples are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. And nowadays, there are also a lot more studies focusing on neurodegenerative diseases. So as was mentioned before in the other presentations, uh, circadian disruption or misalignment is nowadays one of the core symptoms for Alzheimer's disease and is also a red flag for developing Parkinson's disease at a later age. But we when we want to talk about the association between light, circadian rhythm, and well-being, we first have to define what well-being is. And um, don't get me wrong, this has been studied for over hundreds of years, and it still goes on today. Um, but there are some things that we can say about what well-being is, and especially about the way that we measure it. So, for example, there are a few common validated well-being measures. So, for example, we have the uh, subjective happiness scale or the flourishing scale. And also in the um, expertise of well-being, we would say that well-being kind of has two different aspects that are very much related to each other. So on the one side, we would have uh, subjective well-being, which is really about how do you feel about the things in your life and how happy are you with the things in your life? And on the other hand, we would have a psychological well-being, which is more about how engaged you are with the things that you do in your daily life. Now, the thing is that if you ask someone, he or she could mention tons of other things that they would think are related to well-being. Uh, so for example, uh, relationships, uh, exercise, whether you're healthy or not, and things like that. And that's why when you look at the literature, well-being is kind of used as an umbrella to cover, cover like tons of aspects that are related to your well-being. But uh, the validated well-being measures are actually um, kind of lacking or rarely being used. So keeping that in mind, um, the number of studies on light that include these measures are uh, very limited. Um, luckily, there are a few who have done so. And they, for example, have identified an association between light and well-being through safety. So the theory here is that if people are in a well-lit environment, they feel more safe. And when you feel more safe, you experience more well-being. Um, but we also all know the examples of the bright light therapy studies, uh, which sometimes find an effect and sometimes they don't find an effect. But the thing here is that often they do not use the validated well-being measures, but they would use what we call well-being derivatives. So for example, they would use uh, depression measures, mood measures, sleep measures, and health measures, instead of the actual well-being measures. Um, so to summarize it, we think it's necessary to study the association between light and well-being because it's just necessary to Im implement um, or include the validated well-being measures in these contexts, to our opinion. So moving on to the second part, uh, like I said, we're doing some projects simultaneously um, in which we look at the association between circadian rhythm and well-being uh, and in which we will also use polygenic scores. So first, what you need to know here is that 
as you know, the circadian rhythm is very much influenced by environmental factors. So we've mentioned light and we've mentioned food intake as well. Uh, but there's also a large genetic component to this. So family studies have shown that the circadian rhythm is for 50% heritable, which means that the differences between people in their circadian rhythm can for 50% be attributed to genetic factors. And as also mentioned before, um, in 2017, Jeffrey Hall and his colleagues uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize for identifying three core genes or key genes that will play a key role in the biological mechanism that underlies the circadian rhythm, and they refer to them as the clock genes. Now, um, nowadays, circadian rhythm or circadian rhythm measures are becoming also more and more popular in genome-wide association studies. And in these so-called GUA studies, researchers basically look at the entire genome and try to find out which genetic variants in there are associated with a certain trait. So a very good example of one of these studies um, is by Jones and his colleagues, and they took the trait morningness, so a derivative from circadian rhythm, and in which they basically just asked the participants, do you identify as a morning person or as an evening person? And they applied the method of GWAS to this trait. So what they do here is that they took the, take the entire genome, and for every genetic variant in there, there, they asked the question, does this genetic variance increase your risk of being a morning person, yes or no? And through this method, they were able to identify 351 genetic variants that are supposedly related to being a morning person. Now, what we are actually going to do with this is that we will use this kind of knowledge. So on the genetic variants that are related to circadian rhythm measures, to create polygenic scores, for example. And from these polygenic scores, we wanna see if we can predict well-being outcomes. And as you can already guess, we will be using the validated well-being measures, as I mentioned before. So I'll take the next couple of slides of, to explain to you what that would look like, how we can create these scores, and what this would actually mean. So what is a polygenic score? Well, a polygenic score is a personal score of basically your own genetic risk of showing a certain trait. So let's stick with the example of morningness. Um, say that this is the uh, results from the GWAS, then in this case, they would have found that the genetic variants 2A, 4B, 5A, and 7A are related or increase your chance of being a morning person. Then if I want to know my polygenic score, I would take my own genome and look at my own genetic variants, and I would see how many of my variants actually match the variants that they found in their GWAS study. So in this case, I would have matches 2A, 4B, 7A, and then my polygenic score would be a 3. But of course, I could also do this for my neighbor, who obviously has a different genome. Uh, and in this case, he would only have one match, which would make his polygenic score be a 1. So just to keep in mind, a polygenic score is your own individual genetic score, uh, which represents your risk of having a certain trait. Now, what can we actually do with this polygenic score? So in our study, we will use the polygenic scores to see if we can predict well-being outcome measures. And the word predict here is very important because it, in this context, it means that we want to see if we can predict or how much variance we can predict from well-being using the polygenic scores for morningness. And this is kind of a simple uh, analysis, basically, because you basically just look at the correlations between your polygenic scores in your sample and the well-being outcome measures in your sample and just look at the correlations. And based on other GWAS studies or polygenic score studies, we expect to be able to explain maybe three to 4% from the well-being outcome measures. But now what can we actually do with this type of study? Because three to 4% doesn't sound like a lot, I got that. Um, but there are some things that we can tell from this. So first of all, it's important to mention here that we will not be able to rule out direct causation. And this is also something that was mentioned in the discussion before, because say if we take the polygenic score, oh sorry, the genetic variants in the polygenic score, it might be possible that these genetic variants influence another part or another functioning in your body. So for example, heart functioning or something like that, or something in your brain. 
And then through the functioning in your brain, then that will actually uh, influence your well-being. So we cannot unfortunately rule out uh, the idea of direct causation. It might be indirect. But the good news is that we can rule out backward causation through this method, because in this case, backward causation, um, which is often kind of an issue in correlational studies, but in this case, backward causation would mean that your well-being score would influence your polygenic score. And we do, we do not know that much, but we do know that your polygenic score cannot be changed because we know that the genetic variant in your genome is set. So that could never be changed through your well-being score, of course. Um, so that is something that we can rule out here. Now, clinically speaking, we could use polygenic scores to identify people who are at risk of, in this case, being happier than others or less happy than others. So say that we are able to find a significant correlation between these two variables and say that genome-wide association studies uh, get more like larger sample sizes and we, at some point in the future, will be able to explain like maybe 40% of the variance because of our polygenic scores for morningness, then we would know two things already because First, it tells us that the genetic variants that apparently play a role in morningness uh, also play a role in your well-being, direct or indirectly. But it also tells us that it may be a way through early identify people who are at risk of being, for example, less happy than other people. And this early detection theory is something that clinicians are uh, often very interested in. So just to summarize in the final slides, um, we think it's necessary to uh, include validated well-being measures in the studies that are being done on uh, light and well-being and the association. So that's why we're doing that in, this, in the Enlightenment project. Um, and simultaneously, we're going to try to predict well-being outcomes through the, um, uh, sorry, through the polygenic scores. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. And otherwise, you can always contact me uh, through Twitter or through email, of course. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Is there any question from the audience? If not, uh, I can make a comment. Uh, uh, and we discussed it before, you know, the role of uh, clock genes in uh, also some uh, um, um, mood disorders, like, for example, seasonal affective disorder. And we do know that the chronotype are also linked to the possible association to some mood dis disorders. So I think this is very relevant also for this connection, because we do know that, for example, people with a delayed phase are more prone to, to have some of these uh, mood uh, disturbances. This is... Yeah. Yeah, I know I, what you're saying is very interesting because when you mentioned it in the presentation, I was like, so you're mostly referring to the genetic variants related to the clock genes that are identified there. And these are the studies that I mentioned from Jones. It's like looking at the entire genome, not only specified to the clock genes, of course, but I think it's great if that information should totally be combined in those studies. Yeah, because they are all very closely linked. So there is an interaction of all these components. Ah, there is a question from Marina. Uh, yes. Oh, it's very dark here. Hi. Um, I really like your presentation. I'm looking forward to see what you what you find. Um, I'm not part of, of the group, so I'm, I'm wondering what are the validated well-being uh, questionnaires of tools that you use? Um, yeah, so I don't know if you can, I don't know how many there are, if you can name them all, or if I can send you an email just to find out about it. <laughs> yeah, you can, of course, so you can always send me an email. I think I got like four or five prepared in my head. So like I mentioned, we have kind of, we kind of look at well-being from two sides. So we have mm -hmm. this more subjective side. And on that list would be the subjective, uh, sorry, subjective happiness scale, the quality of life scale based on the control letter. So basically the one question item, so where would you put your life in general on this letter? Okay. Um, and we have the satisfaction with life scale for that side. And the psychological well-being measures, uh, we don't have that many for those, but we uh, ourselves often use the uh, flourishing skill. And you have a long version and a short version, but that's that's a very popular one. Okay, great. I might, I might send you an email. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Other questions?
or comments? Okay. Valerio has a comment. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, very nice. Um, so uh, my comment uh, is um, <clears throat> we can look at uh, the genetics uh, from uh, many point of views. Um, as you know, uh, we will be running uh, the polygenic scores in light me, uh, but also the other uh, neglected genome, which is the mitochondrial genome. So uh, mitochondria are a former bacteria which colonized our cells and um, they can be considered the microbiome of uh, the cell internal. Uh, the mitochondrial DNA uh, mutates much faster and adapts to environment. So I expect to see uh, that people living in Northern Europe uh, as opposed to Southern Europe, just because of the daylight differences uh, could have adapted through specific uh, sets of variants. So it will be very interesting to incorporate in the polygenic risk score of the nuclear genome, also the genetic variability of mitochondrial DNA. Each of us uh, has a different uh, setup of polymorphic variants, which is much, much larger than uh, the nuclear genome. Uh, so I expect to see interesting things there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, me too. And I think that's that's a wonderful part of the project as well, because like we're doing right now, we're only doing a uh, polygenic score based on the nuclear DNA, because we simply don't have any microbial information from our participants. So that's going to be like a unique way for us to also experience that kind of uh, research, that new level. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Dan, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, I'll take, uh, I'll take over. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, here we go. Share, and then I do. So can everybody see this? Yeah. Great, good. So um, so I've just written down some key points here that, that we heard in the three wonderful presentations we just had. Uh, I, I was typing them um, uh, or, or changing them as the presentations went along. Um, I really like the, the Good Light group. Uh, uh, approach of saying good light is attractive, it's dynamic, optimized and personal. Um, it also shows you that we are looking at an enormous variation of different type of uh, health and, and well-being aspects that, uh, that we uh, need to consider uh, and how light could influence that. Um, then of course we, uh, we had some really good uh, uh, comparisons of tools of looking at this melanopic equivalent of daylight and luminance and, and, and what the biological consequences of that are, such as melatonin suppression. Um, it is important um, to point out that, of course, light acts as a zeitgeber, uh, so a synchronizing cue for the circadian clock in the hypothalamus, uh, not in the liver, um, not in the kidneys, not anywhere else. Um, it, there's a link there within the network. Um, uh, but also light has other roles outside of the circadian time system uh, and it affects sleep and mood uh, in other ways, uh, which I think is important to keep in mind. Uh, and then, of course, Anna says, uh, you know, what is well-being related to light? Uh, and more importantly, uh, you know, what is well-being um, and, you know, how are we going to define that within the context of this project? Um, and then, of course, the, the individual genetic differences that could drive uh, um, differences in well-being, but obviously could also drive the, the differences in effectiveness of light on that well-being. Uh, and of course, we'll be looking at that within the project, which is uh, really important, but it's really good to highlight that. So then I was thinking about in terms of discussion, um, you know, what we're really trying to do here, of course, is to achieve uh, a discussion and understand 
what is good light for older adults? Because that's the group of people that we're working with uh, within this project. Uh, so here's a little picture of Jules Dilder, who is a, a, a poet um, and uh, was also called the uh, mayor by night of, of Rotterdam. Um, he's uh, passed away now, but what you can see is that he would always wear sunglasses and wouldn't see uh, an enormous amount of light. Um, but of course, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve here. What, what is the best light for older adults uh, compared to maybe younger adults uh, or, or even children? And what are those critical features? If you look at light, um, there's lots of stuff that we haven't discussed yet. Um, so uh, we've talked about spectrum and intensity, uh, but the timing of that light, of course, within the project is a, is a clear discussion that we need to have. Um, but also we can think about, you know, very small changes and fluctuations and the quality of, uh, of the light, uh, which might be different for, for uh, or have different effects uh, on, on people from different age ranges. Um, and then what is it that we're really looking at in terms of, um, uh, of, of the positive effects of light? Um, I've not got well-being on here, but obviously, Anna, that, that's one of the things that we need to look at. Um, but there is sleep, there's activity, so we're measuring that through uh, 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 activity uh, recordings. Uh, there's moods, uh, effective status, and we should really be looking at all of those. Um, but of course, light might be affecting uh, those in different ways and different types of, um, of, of intensities and spectrums may or may not be within the range of really uh, uh, affecting these different outcomes. Uh, and then I think, uh, and I'm sure many of you are thinking about this, is how are we going to achieve this exposure uh, indoor uh, um, for the participants in this study? So what is the practicality that we're looking at? Um, of course, um, light for me, uh, um, as a chronobiologist is only one of the synchronizing cues. Uh, um, but let's think about the meal that you might possibly have uh, when you sit down at the table with that light in front of you. Uh, think about the changes in activity uh, that are associated with that. And of course, what is the application? Um, we do want them to, uh, to actually um, benefit from that light throughout the whole year, uh, uh, which is a, a challenge. I think that we that we all recognize, but that we really want to achieve. Um, and then below that, I've got some some wider ranging questions, but I really think those top questions are, are quite interesting. Um, so maybe um, we could start by defining uh, all the different ways of that we're trying to measure these effects of light uh, and whether we all feel um, that particular lights uh, will affect all of these traits in the same way. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the light we're going to use has a warm and a cool setting. Um, the way that I understand is that cool setting would probably be more beneficial during the day, whilst the warm setting is more beneficial at night. Um, but for mood, um, that might be quite different. Um, so I think, you know, the floor is open to those questions. Uh, so I, I welcome uh, views that people have on that. Uh, uh, and, and help us design the approach that we're really going to take. So I'll close this particular screen so that we can see each other again. Yes. So any ideas? Thank you, first of all, Dan. I have, I have something in mind is related. Uh, maybe we should include also, since we know that uh, it's so, so important, uh, circadian dysfunction in terms of uh, cognitive problems related to this. We should include in our uh, questionnaires assessments also a cognitive uh, evaluation because uh, yeah, this is very uh, is very relevant the effects that circadian dysfunction may have on cognition. This is something yeah. that we should be... Uh, and possibly uh, attention as well, which I think, yeah. um, especially in, in, uh, in older adults, uh, is, is something that we would want to improve uh, and, and like can really um, help in. So yes, absolutely, that's a good take on point. Yeah. Any other ideas? Just writing this down because my own attention span isn't always great. Um, so um, do we expect light um, to affect uh, mood 
and cognition in the same way that it might be affecting uh, uh, the circadian clock system? Do we think that the same light exposure is, is good for that? Or should we balance that out a little bit? Or we're just going to say two hours of cool, bright light in the morning uh, um, or whenever during the active day. Uh, and are we going to say that that is going to be the same on every day? Uh, you know, in, in the working population, we very often, for instance, make a distinction between weekdays and weekends. We have what is known as social jet lag. Um, um, how are we going to, uh, to, to, to look for that? Are we going to understand what different types of days uh, people have uh, and, and how light exposure then affects um, their activity pattern? I think <clears throat> one of my comments, uh, oh, sorry, someone raised their hand. Oh, it's okay, Roland, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, my bag is next. <clears throat> one of my comments, on what you mentioned was is the light that affects a good system the same as is it the same as that affects the mood and honestly i don't know answer to that question uh, but um, in terms of the common indoor lighting lighting environments they mostly have white less sources and people tend to stay away from narrow band sources so if it's for the circadian system, what the data suggests thus far is spectrum is not as important as the absolute amount and timing uh, of the light. So that gives us some leeway. So as long, for, for instance, as long as you provide, for, for example, a thousand lux at the eye during the daytime for the two hours, you know, the spectrum is irrelevant. So spectrum perhaps can be a key in terms of optimizing at an individual level for mood. Um, that allows us some leeway. Another uh, point I would like to make uh, is that what we understand less as of now is the effect of photic history and on our sensitivity to subsequent light exposures. And perhaps some work needs to go into that in terms of the immediate photic history of two hours and more of a long-term photic history or chronic, at a chronic level of cons consistent bright light exposures um, during the mornings. And how can they change? For example, if someone commutes to work under bright sunlight every day, it's going to be a lot different for someone who works from home. Uh, and, and lastly, I, I would like to again stress uh, the, the point of distribution. So what we have, we have seen in our studies is that for visual performance, it doesn't matter, 20 lux uh, on the task plane, probably going to be good, the same visual performance if it's on axis or off uh, or, or off axis, but in terms of the circadian system for, this, for the same amount of light at the eye, the kind of distribution of the light source has shown to affect the effectiveness. For instance, light boxes kept in or uh, get right in front of people are a lot more effective. Is that what the data says as compared to light boxes kept peripherally uh, beyond the 20 degree vision, even though they provide the same amount of light at the eye? So I think that poses another challenge. So perhaps in terms of circadian system, it matters, but it may not matter for mood uh, in terms of the absolute amount at the retina. So these are some of the challenges that will have to be addressed going forward. Yeah, no, I, that's great. I think there's some really interesting points there. Uh, um, I, I don't know whether we want to have uh, the participants in our study uh, um, um, we want to get them to the point where we tell them to sit down for two whole hours uh, so that we can exactly adjust the angle at which it comes into the eye um, or whether a more practical approach is needed there. I'm just going back to your statement saying that, that, that the spectral composition uh, doesn't matter. Um, um, I would think that uh, it does matter a little bit, doesn't it? Because we, we do have different photic systems uh, going into the, uh, the SCN, uh, and especially uh, uh, when you go towards an aging population, degradation in these pathways might be differential. Uh, um, so it's certainly something to consider, I, I would say. Um, but of course, your point is, is well taken that uh, it does need to be fairly bright. Uh, and I think that's the point that Jan was, uh, was making as well. So yeah, thank you. Marijke? 
Yeah, thank you. I think uh, I'm very happy that I'm uh, after Rowan <laughs> because um, I think uh, he made some very good points that I had in mind as well. Uh, uh, to start off with the last one with spectrum and intensity, I more or less agree that um, as long as we increase light intensity during the day and reduce light intensity during the evening and the night, we do a very good job. Um, and of course, we do want more bluish uh, during the day and less bluish in the evening. But um, as, as long as you increase overall intensity and reduce overall intensity, you, you are doing already a much better job than, than people have now. Um, and so, so, yeah, I agree with, uh, with that, that uh, when we choose at the safe side of just normal photopic light intensity, uh, then we will um, reduce melanopic intensity or increase melanopic intensity as well. And that's maybe a much, it's much simpler message to the elderly people in society um, to have an app and say, try to get a thousand lux uh, instead of uh, try to get 250 melanopic uh, light on your IPRGCs. I mean, that's not the message that, uh, that we can give. Um, so so that, wa that was one thing. The other thing, um, uh, two more points. Um, you asked about the effects on mood and on on uh, circadian system, and from my point of view, from my experience starting off as a PhD, uh, investigating the effects of light in depression, um, and later on more in chronobiology, I would suggest that uh, the exact timing of the light um, for a response in mood is less important than the exact timing for getting a response on sleep in the circadian system. So if you increase light intensity during the day for at, or in the morning for at least half an hour or, or, or two hours, um, at some point in the morning, you will definitely be able to, to improve uh, uh, mood, uh, especially in winter depressed people. Um, but if you want to shift the clock or shift sleep, then the timing must be much better and, and much more accurate. Um, Sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, can I? Please. The timing, of course, I think the PRC, so the advances or the delays that, that light can cause to the circadian system uh, is, is slightly delayed in, in the elderly population. Um, so would that change? So with delays, is that the inflection point from going from a delay to an advancing point uh, is later in the day? Um, would that change maybe the approach that we would take? Because normally you would say really at the point of waking up, right, is, is really where you want to have most of that exposure. Can we be a little bit more generous, maybe take a longer period than, say, two hours or say as long as it's before noon? Uh, it, it will be beneficial. Yeah, if my answer would be yes, especially in the elderly, because uh, especially in the elderly, elderly, you probably do not want to advance them um, very much. In no. most cases, the elderly are already pretty uh, early, have an early awaking time, and you don't want to to make that even earlier. So I would say that as long as you have, I would say in general, but of course, I'm also a board member of the Good Light Group. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would say if we will be able to get these recommendations that you need at least two hours of daytime light or those intensities and less light, preferably in the morning, but not too early, not at the real phase advancing time yeah. um, and really less light in the evening. If we get that message there, and people will really uh, improve that, then we would get the evidence whether those kind of general recommendations are effective, and especially in an elderly population. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Sorry, you had a third point? Yeah, the, first, the third thing that's more or less related to this is that you asked about social jet lag. And um, uh, at least in the Netherlands, I'm not don't exactly know the, the retirement ages in Bologna and Tartu, but um, we will aim at uh, almost retired people. So um, 
I presume what I know from others who are already retired is that social jet lag will be much less. People will will live much more to their own preferred circadian chronotype. And that means that we probably should not have uh, an aim that is too much uh, dedicated to, to reducing social jet lag or something like that. Totally. I completely agree with you on that. Uh, it's certainly not an aim of the project anyway. And I would also agree that most people are retired and therefore are unlikely to have a directed uh, a schedule. Um, but we do know there's certain uh, uh, events such as, this is very stereotypical, so forgive me for this, but uh, say, for instance, days where grandparents want to take care of their grandchildren, um, uh, which, according at least to my parents, can be quite tiring and uh, uh, puts quite a bit of a demand on their day. Uh, and I think it is, uh, it is a confounder uh, if we don't have any type of measure for that. Sure. Sure, I agree that um, you that you do not have a paid job is not necessarily mean that there are no other obligations who, who uh, dictate some of your time. And we should f we should look at that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But I guess it's a single question, right? Uh, yeah. And I was talking to Anna the other day about what that question could be, because the question can't be, is today a working day or a free day? Um, but we can ask the question, and I think this was on a suggestion, is did you put an alarm clock this morning, uh, um, um, which could be some kind of indication of whether there is a directed structured day that is demanding rather than a free day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. good idea. That was uh, my was comments. Point? Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, any other input from people? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, emphasize this uh, point because it was um, the focus of what we discussed was about the day, which is uh, uh, the most important thing. But also, it's important to remember that uh, especially blue light during the evening, night uh, can affect a, a lot circadian rhythms. And this is uh, something that we should uh, emphasize. This is very important. And also because there is this light pollution in the evening, which is very relevant, especially for children, but also for uh, um, adults. Uh, this is something that we should uh, take into account, uh, as Marike mentioned. Yeah. Do you want to say? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, uh, just a, a little note for tomorrow. Uh, I would like to remember that the session uh, will start tomorrow at 9.30 and then uh, we will have an afternoon session, which is a plenary session, starting at 3.30 p.m. So the, the, the morning will be 9.30 to uh, uh, half past noon and then 3.30, 5.30. Just a little note. Thank you. Okay, I, I think then um, that's uh, that that brings this session to a close. So I want to uh, to thank everybody for their contribution. Uh, I think it's really some very good conversation, very good discussion. Uh, uh, surely there are some gaps out there that uh, some of which we can try to uh, address in this project, and some we will have to take forward until after that. Uh, and, and I think it's also really important that we've made the point that. Um, this study will actually also give us an opportunity to identify certain cohorts of people that we might have additional interest in uh, and that we want to address some questions in. So I think that was uh, that was really useful. So thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you tomorrow again online, of course. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.